Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Diplexers. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical introduction to diplexers and how diplexers are used, as well as explain the most important diplexer characteristics and how they're measured. This presentation assumes a very basic knowledge of S parameters and a very basic knowledge of filter measurements. If you're unfamiliar with these topics, or if you'd like a brief review, you might want to watch the presentation understanding S parameters and or understanding filter measurements before beginning this presentation. Let's start by defining what we mean by a diplexer. Diplexers are passive bidirectional RF components with three ports, a low pass port, a high pass port, and a common port, sometimes also called a mix port. Relatively wide filters are used to combine and or separate signals into different non-overlapping frequency ranges or bands. These bands are usually far apart, that is, they're separated by tens or even hundreds of megahertz. Diplexers are most often used to enable two devices, transmitters or receivers, to share a single antenna. But they also allow a single device to use two different antennas. We'll look more closely at these two scenarios on the next slide. In order to combine or separate signals, diplexers must also provide high isolation between the low-pass and high-pass ports. And as we'll see, this is an important diplexer measurement. Finally, it should be noted that diplexers often have a fixed configuration. Their frequency ranges, etc., are not normally user-configurable or user-tunable. Diplexers come in a variety of form factors and are used in many different applications. But in this presentation, and in our examples, we'll show connectorized diplexers, such as the ones used for two-way radio applications. Let's now come back to the topic of how diplexers are connected. Most often, a diplexer is used to connect two devices, transmitters and or receivers, to a single antenna. An example of this would be a radio that has separate connectors for different frequency bands, but which is being used with a multi-band antenna. The other way of using a diplexer is to connect two antennas into a single port. An example of this would be a radio which transmits or receives on different bands using antennas which are optimized for each band. It's important to remember that diplexers are bidirectional and can be used for both transmitting and receiving. Before moving on, it's worth pointing out that diplexers are essentially two-port multiplexers. Although we'll be focusing on diplexers in this presentation, it's not uncommon to find multiplexers with higher port counts, such as triplexers with three ports or quadplexers with four ports. These higher port count multiplexers have the same use and characteristics as diplexers, and what we cover in the remainder of this presentation can be applied to these devices as well. However, do keep in mind that triplexers, quadplexers, etc. may be more difficult to design and or have stricter requirements than diplexers, depending on the width and spacing of each frequency band. This is because as the number of bands increases, it becomes more challenging to implement filters that can provide adequate isolation between the different bands. Let's now take a look inside of a diplexer. The low and high pass filters in connectorized diplexers are most often constructed using so-called lumped components, that is, discrete capacitors and inductors. In the image on the right, we can see the high pass path on the left, with capacitors in series and inductor coils connected to ground. The low pass path on the right has inductor coils in series and the capacitors connected to ground. Using lumped components reduces the cost, complexity, size, and weight of a diplexer. Because diplexer frequency bands are relatively far apart, higher performance or more selective filters, such as cavity filters, are generally not required when constructing most types of diplexers. Diplexer characteristics and performance are most often measured using a vector network analyzer, but in many cases it's also possible to use a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator. 
As mentioned a few moments ago, diplexers generally do not require high-performance filters, so the instruments used to measure diplexers normally do not require a very high dynamic range. Most diplexer measurements are made pairwise, or between two ports at a time. Unused ports should be appropriately terminated. And, as with other network measurements, a calibration should be performed to improve accuracy as well as to remove the influence of the test setup, such as the connectors, cables, etc. There are three basic diplexer measurements. The insertion loss between each port and the common port, the isolation between the high and low ports, and the voltage standing wave ratio or return loss seen at each port. Let's start by looking at insertion loss. Insertion loss is the attenuation that occurs within each port's frequency range or passband. This attenuation is undesirable and should be as low as possible. We measure insertion loss by making a so-called S21 measurement between the low pass or high pass port and the common port. Power is sourced from our VNA or tracking generator and injected into the low or high port. And this power is compared to the power emerging from the common port. Note that the unused port should be properly terminated with a match or dummy load. It's also possible to make this measurement in the other direction, that is from common to low or high. For most well-constructed diplexers, insertion loss is typically on the order of 1 dB or less, but may differ slightly between each of the ports. Let's look at an example insertion loss measurement. For this diplexer, the low frequency range is specified as 1 MHz to 150 MHz, and the high frequency range is specified as 350 MHz to 500 MHz. We'll shade each region for ease of interpretation. Measuring between the low and common ports, we see very low insertion loss, less than 1 dB over the nominal low frequency range, although insertion loss only begins to increase significantly around 225 MHz. In the other direction, we see insertion loss on the high side is also relatively low and constant over the nominal high side frequency range although the high side insertion loss is somewhat higher compared to the low side insertion loss. Next we'll look at isolation, which measures how much signal leaks between the low side and the high side ports. Ideally, the amount of power coupled between these ports would be zero. Isolation is measured by sourcing power into either the high or low port, and then measuring the amount of power which appears at the other port. This measurement should be made in both directions, that is, both S21 and S12 measurements, although the results tend to be very similar. As with other diplexer measurements, the unused port, in this case the common port, should be properly terminated. Typical diplexer isolation values are in the mid to high tens of dB. The degree of isolation becomes more important when the high or low ports are connected to transmitters, but is less important in the case where the diplexer is being used to connect to multiple antennas. Let's look at an isolation measurement. Here we can see that there is 60 to 70 dB of isolation between the low port and the high port, but only over the nominal low and high frequency ranges. Between these ranges, the diplexer provides much less isolation a signal appearing at about 240 MHz at the low port would appear at the high port with only about 25 dB of attenuation. It's also worth noting that we get essentially the same isolation values when measuring from the high port to the low port of our diplexer. A well-designed diplexer should also provide a good impedance match at all of its ports over each port's nominal frequency range. This is quantified in terms of return loss or voltage standing wave ratio. A simple formula can be used to convert return loss to visoire and vice versa. To measure either of these quantities, a signal is sourced into one port of the diplexer and the amount of reflected power is measured. As with other diplexer measurements, the unused ports of the diplexer 
should be appropriately terminated. In the ideal case, ports will have very low visoir slash very high return loss. Note that when using a spectrum analyzer and tracking generator to measure reflected power, a so-called visoir bridge or directional coupler may be needed. Let's look at some return loss measurements on the low and high ports of our diplexer. This diplexer specifies a visoir of less than 1.2 over each port's frequency range, which corresponds to a return loss of approximately 20 dB. Looking at the low port, we see that visoir does stay, just barely, below 1.2 over the specified low side input range, and there is a sharp increase in return loss near 145 MHz. On the high side, we notice that visoir is actually not in spec over the first 50 MHz or so of the high side frequency range, although there is a sharp notch in return loss around 445 MHz, and this means excellent visoir around this frequency. Before we end this presentation, let's briefly explain the difference between diplexers and duplexers. These words are sometimes used as if they were interchangeable, and even some diplexer manufacturers have been known to do this as well. This is a somewhat understandable mistake, because like diplexers, duplexers are also three-port devices that combine signals onto a single common antenna port. However, duplexers are normally used to isolate very closely spaced transmit and receive frequencies. Here, Closely spaced usually means a few megahertz or less. Duplexers enable simultaneous transmit and receive of closely spaced signals on a single antenna, without the risk of receiver damage or desense. And this is critical in radio repeater systems and similar applications. Unlike the relatively wide high-pass and low-pass filters used in diplexers, Duplexers are built using much narrower bandpass filters, and even narrower notch filters. This normally requires use of cavity filters instead of the lumped elements used in many diplexers. Another important distinction between diplexers and duplexers is that duplexers must be manually tuned during installation, whereas diplexers are generally fixed and not user configurable. Please see the separate presentation understanding duplexers, if you'd like to learn more about duplexers, how they're used, and how they're measured. Let's end with a brief summary. Diplexers are three-port RF devices which combine and or separate signals on two different frequency ranges or bands. They consist of a low-pass port, a high-pass port, and a common port which passes the combined high and low signals. Diplexers are most often used either to connect one device to two antennas or two devices to a single antenna. Measuring or characterizing diplexers can be done using a vector network analyzer or the combination of a spectrum analyzer and tracking generator. In this presentation, we covered the three most important measurements made on diplexers, namely insertion loss, isolation, and return loss or voltage standing wave ratio. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Diplexers. If you'd like to learn more about measuring diplexers and other RF devices, or about measurement instruments from Rodi and Schwartz, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at rody-schwartz.com.